Hi there, welcome back to Diagonal Move. My name is Neil, and today I'm going to be taking a look at a game called Winter Thunder, which is a tiny battle publishing game designed by Brian Train. Uh, and it covers the Battle of the Bulge during the tail end of the Second World War, which was the last German offensive across Europe before the end of the war. Uh, it's a subject that has been turned into many, many games previously. But this is actually my first time that I've had a, a Battle of the Bulge game myself, so I thought it would be quite interesting to, to play Winter Thunder. I can get it print and play. I can um, fit it onto my coffee table, which is always good. And, um, of course, there are some interesting things going on with the map and the matrix system, which I'll show in a moment. So what I'll do here today is I will take a look at the map, take a look at some of the units, and then play through an example turn. The intention is to try to provide an overview of how the game works, uh, not to cover every rule. There's um, not too many rules as, as this type of game goes. However, there's a few different special rules and a few different rules based on unit types and so on. Um, but hopefully I'll give you enough to cover the, the, the bones of what's going on in the game and help you decide whether it's for you. It is, of course, a game where the Germans will move one way and then at a certain point in the game the Americans will come and move the other way. And that's going to be basically the same every time you play. So we bear that in mind as we go. Um, what I'll do now then is I will just move over to, to the map and go from there. Let's take a quick look at the map for Winter Thunder. The uh, copy comes in four sections when it's print and play for ease of printing at home. The retail version obviously will just be one one map sheet and I think you can get a single map sheet for printing off at, at, as well if you can do a single map sheet at home. But it's, it's just one map sheet, it's pretty small in overall size. It's quite an interesting map though in the sense of how the, how the terrain limits movement and and removes the need for zones of control and so on. There's no zone of control in the map. So let's just have a quick look at what is on this map. Um, slightly, um, and this is tricky to see, but along here we have these hexagonal uh, hexes with, with a hexagonal border, a dotted border. These are the West Wall fortifications that the Germans had along the the border with with the Ardennes region um, of Europe, and it, the setup for the Germans will be mostly along this line, and they'll control everything behind it. The Allies, uh, beginning with the American forces, will be this side of the map. The uh, western and central area will be empty at the start of the game. Um, in terms of the terrain, you have a few a few things. It's all very blue, uh, but there's some there's some clear terrain here um, and just here as well. Very sort of white. The paler blue colour is actually woods. The darker blue is forest. And then you have roads, towns, and then cities. There are rivers. These have uh, a number of terrain effects, uh, basically make it very difficult to move across the rivers uh, with, with your, your units, uh, restricting movement through the rivers. Um, and one river that's particularly important in the game is this larger, larger blue line here, which is the Moose River. That is key to certain special rules within the game involving how the British forces move uh, basically, they can't cross the river until the Germans reach the river. The cities are victory points for the Germans, as are the as are any, any other cities. Um, but if if the Germans cross the river and escape the map, either to the western edge or to the northwest, that's extra victory points for the Germans. They do have a <coughs> excuse me. The Germans do have a number of additional victory conditions over what the Allies have and the key one really is the 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 escaping the map through the western and northwestern edges. In terms of terrain, the key thing to remember with the terrain is the forests. The forests 
act as a limit on movement for motorised units. The vast majority of units in the game are motorised, and whereas stacking is normally two, two counters plus a HQ counter, in the forests it's one counter. Uh, even along the road, and motorized units cannot enter forests except on the road, and that's applicable uh, even through combat and, and, and all other sorts of movement when reinforcements are placed and so on. Um, the the sort of darker color here that's that's rough terrain. There's no real restriction on that, um, but this stacking limit of two reduced to one for certain units in the forest creates traffic jams and really creates uh, a, a, a very much a series of channels through which forces will mostly move and that alleviates any real need for zone of control there's no zone of control in here um, the other thing about the map is and this is probably a good place to show you uh, is that it have also is home to the mission mission matrix down the bottom. And what will happen with the mission matrix is rather than rolling a ton of dice and checking a CRT, you'll choose a counter. There's, there's four red counters and six blue counters. Red counters are attack, blue counters are defend. Uh, in the two player game, each player will choose one of those counters uh, without the other one knowing simultaneously reveal. In the solo game, which I'll be playing uh, an example turn off, you roll two dice, one to determine the overall posture of the defenders and one to determine what the actual mission will be. You then roll a d10 and check it against the casualties. Worth noting the d10 is a zero when it's a zero, not a ten. Uh, only other thing to note really with the map, with, with what I've got out in front of me at the moment before we move into the units and so on, is the the reinforcement schedule uh, and this will show you a few different things there's the weather which i'll talk about more more when we play the turn there's the um uh things like uh when strategic movement can, movement can happen and so on all listed on, on this 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 schedule um but it's probably worth noting right at the beginning of the game the germans by far have the advantage as time passes certainly by the time you hit turn four the advantage has very much swung in favour of the Allies, and that's going to be basically the same every time you play. Um, so, with that in mind, um, we'll look in more depth at the units and the setup uh, shortly, and I'll see you downstairs on the other table where I've got a bit more space to play. This is the setup position for Winter Thunder at the start of turn one. The German forces in this olive colour are hugging their west wall defences in quite large numbers. There's a, a fair number of quite strong units in there as well. Um, the Allied forces uh, are only American forces at this point, and they are also adjacent to that west wall, but in lower numbers, uh, in weaker, num weaker unit strengths, and in certain locations rather than in, in in such density throughout the western and central parts of the map are empty at this point in the game all the action takes place over on the west now there are some different unit types and different counter types uh, within those units as well so these counters towards the uh, right hand side of the screen these are the activation chits these are placed into a, into a cup or, or some other container and you pull them out one at a time and the units that are activated are those that match the numbers on, on, on the flags um, so that's going to mean that sometimes all Germans will activate in a row sometimes the Americans will activate uh, alternately and so on and so forth. It randomizes who goes when. Now these these counters, uh, these activation counters, match up with some of the counters on the map. And so, for example, if you pull one of these out of the map, you may activate one of these HQ counters. And these HQ counters are very important. There are different types. Um, and 
the type is determined by the crosses on the top of the counter. So here we have an army HQ with four crosses, and this is a core HQ with three crosses. And that distinction is very important. It's important because there are slightly different activation processes for an army versus a core HQ. And it's also extremely important for supply. Um, essentially, an army HQ will supply a, a core HQ and a core HQ will then supply the units. And if that chain isn't present, the units are considered to be out of supply and there are various negative effects, which we'll get into later. The units themselves are broken down into uh, further uh, four sizes. Um, let's grab a couple of the appropriate counters. So we have, if I get them all the right way up, we have these, these counters with two crosses on. That is division, and that's extremely important. That is partly, um, it's, it's used to uh, determine the numbers of reinforcements, it's used for uh, casualty checks, it's used for, um, um, it's, it's used for uh, a few other things as well, which completely escaped me at this point, which is not very good. Um, but essentially, these units are key to a great many things in the game, including victory points. There you go, I've remembered it. Victory points. And then we have brigades, which are the single X. And finally, we have a few regiments as well. Division is key. These are the important ones in terms of structure of um, some of the turns and some of the, the uh, rules within, within the turns. In addition to the the count, the the differences in 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 regiment and brigade and division and that sort of thing, there are also a few other things to note on the counters. They are different unit types. You have artillery, armor, motorized infantry, um, another motorized unit which escapes me currently. I'll have to look that up shortly. Uh, airborne infantry and then regular infantry. The numbers are... We have uh, combat strength and movement allowance. If a number is in brackets, it means the unit is not a combat unit and that combat strength is only applicable to defence or, in the case of the artillery, uh, if you are supporting something else. There's no attack value on its own. Sometimes you have these letters in the centre and these indicate an elite or a poor unit. These numbers in the corner are ID numbers uh, relating to the historical uh, detachments and so on that you, you had in the battle. Now what I'll do now is I will move on to a a turn to give you an example of how the game plays, cover most of the key mechanics. But I won't play the first turn. Essentially what will happen um, in the first turn and in the first couple of turns, really, well really, yeah, really the first two turns, is not particularly representative of the game as a whole. Um, and so I will play those separately off camera and then come back and play turn three. Uh, part of the reason they're not representative is there are special rules in the first turn that allow the German player to choose which units they're going to activate and then activate up to all of their units before the American player activates any. Um, and essentially what that replicates is sort of a surprise attack by the German forces and it allows the German player to basically charge across the map and probably get to around about here-ish before the reinforcements arrive for the Allies and start to push them back. Um, and there's a similar 
rule in turn two where supply rules are slightly different as well. So between them, they're not very representative. And so I'll move on to, to turn, turn number three. See you in a moment. Beginning our example turn at the start of turn three of Winter Thunder, the first couple of turns have gone exactly as they're supposed to with the German forces punching their way through the American lines uh, to claim a few cities and take control of a few areas uh, to the west of their west wall defences. I'm using these coloured cubes to show control. Uh, I don't have any green cubes, so orange is the US uh, or allied and grey is the German forces. Control is determined by the last person or the last side to move through a location and so um, once you once you enter a city you take control and you retain control if you leave that city or town until somebody from the opposing side moves in and takes control from you uh, and that means it can get a little bit tricky to keep hold of keep uh, an idea of exactly who moved through the cities last as the more and more forces come on the board Okay. Um, reinforcements are added to the map based on these reinforcement trackers on, on the schedule. I've added the reinforcements for turn three. Uh, there were some added along the top uh, in the northwestern region, which are British forces and US forces. In the north region, just here, there was another force, as well as some towards the south, and the Germans had some forces to the east. And those locations are fixed according to the reinforcement schedule, the German, south, north, and so on. There are still a couple of counters on the reinforcement schedule. These are conditional reinforcements, and although the German player has the option of introducing those reinforcements at this point. The cost is two victory points per counter from the top of my head, and that's quite a significant number of victory points to give away to the Allied player, particularly at the beginning of the game. Um, the Allied player only really has a couple of ways to gain victory points, one of which is for the introduction of these conditional forces, these two forces here, uh, the pink one and the grey one, the olive one and the other is to eliminate as many German divisions as possible. Um, the other thing to note about this reinforcement schedule is the British units, and the British units are restricted in where they can go on the map until a certain condition is achieved. So it's another conditional replacement. So although we can place the German units, uh, and they, the, sorry, the, the British units, and the units come on the board on a road hex, uh, absorbing all, all the stacking limits uh, in, in the area of the map that is indicated. But the British cannot then move to cross this river until they are released. And the way they're released is for a German unit to occupy one of the cities adjacent to that river. That is the only real time the British units can cross that river. They act as a, a last line of defence almost against advancing German forces. And the other thing to note on the reinforcement schedule is there's a, a weather. And the weather plays an important part. Uh, currently it's overcast, which means there is no Allied air support. And in the game this is abstracted as uh, some air points that the Allied player can add to a battle, and you, the number varies depending on the weather. Uh, in clear weather, which doesn't really happen until well, until here, where the, where the white the white background on the reinforcement schedule, the clear weather uh, prevents certain types of movement on the German side, and um, also uh, gives the most air points that the allies can use. Um, the next thing we need to do after we've done the re reinforcements uh, is look at replacements. And this is where those divisional uh, counters become very important because although the allied player 
has taken a fair number of casualties during those first couple of turns. Uh, I think we've taken seven in total. We've taken seven casualties on the Allied side. None of them are actually divisions. They're all uh, brigades and regiments. And the replacement rule is that you can only bring in bring one in supply reduced division back to full strength if six divisions have been completely eliminated and even though there are seven counters removed only well there's not even one that counts towards that replacement rule the only other thing to think of in terms of the replacements and the reinforcement schedule is the couple of counters that I've left to the side here and this is just me acting as a way to remind myself that at the end of this turn the eliminated HQs come back in uh, at the end of the third phase of the game not at this point so they're just I just leave these off to one side to remind myself to put those in at the appropriate time so the only f in the beginning of the first phase the initial phase the only thing left to do then is to roll a die and work, determine how many of the German HQ units are actually out of supply. That's, we rolled five, so we halve that, rounding up. So that means that three are out of supply. Let me just mark those with a counter. And it's the German player's choice which of those three are out of supply. Uh, and it's core level that are out of supply. So let's do that one. They can still move and they can still control other units. However, there are certain restrictions placed on what, the distance they can move and issues in combat and so on. Okay. So now we move on to the operations phase, and uh, that's quite simple. We take the cup and we draw a counter. Whichever counter we pull, we activate that HQ. And so we've drawn the third uh, core. I, I'm not entirely sure have the, the terminology, but there's this, this counter, the HQ core HQ counter with the three on it. and. That's all the way down the bottom, just here. Now we can activate uh, up to, so long as we're in supply, and supply is 10 movement points or movement factor points away from an army HQ. So we can sit it in supply, and so we're one, two, three, four, five, six down the road to the third army, army HQ. And so that HQ, that core is in supply and we can now activate other units, divisions, brigades, regiments within five. And so one, two, three, four, five. So really the only unit we can activate at the moment is this one. Perhaps that wasn't the best place for me to place that reinforcement. But it will be, it is what it is, um, so to speak. And so we'd like to activate this. Now we can move either through Tactical movement or strategic movement. Tactical movement is a, a simple one hex at a time move based on movement factors and terrain. Uh, so for example, if we wanted to move along this road, we can move one, two, and three, and that would be tactical movement. Strategic movement is, is slightly different, and strategic movement allows you to move at a faster rate along the roads. Uh, so it would be one, two, three. But you cannot start, end, or move adjacent to an enemy unit. Um, so in this case, we can't do it because we'd move adjacent to this this uh, German infantry division. So what we'll do is I'll just move that one to here. And I will also move my HQ slightly just to ensure re reinforcements at the next turn. Uh, when we move it at the end, when it gets to turn four, we'll, we'll have somewhere to move that's within uh, control range. So there's no combat at the moment, so this simply gets placed back on the reinforcements track at the start of the next turn, and we move on to the next chit. Drawn a German unit, and this is the German 66th Corps. 
that 66th are probably going to be out of supply. I think it's this one. Yeah, so gems are out of supply. Um, and when you're out of supply, motorized units, which is basically everybody except infantry, um, have a reduced movement. So the the movement is reduced by three. So this this unit here, uh, the 66th Corps, only has a movement factor of three, so they cannot actually move. And not a lot else to do with that. So. And you cannot place what's called improvement markers or anything like that. So really, there's not a lot that can be done with that one, with the exception of perhaps commanding somebody to move them into a better position. But if there are other HQs that can do that, it may not be worth doing that at the moment. So let's just, let's just move this one. Do it, move him a couple, just to support. To keep track on who's moved and who hasn't moved, I'm just going to use a couple of extra counters, uh, uh, cubes, just so that I... I can remember. There we go. We've moved these. And not what else, what else we can do now with the 66th course. So that goes on to the reinforcement schedule. And we'll take the next one. And the turns will progress like this. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep going until I've covered most of the rules, maybe seen some combat and so on. And there's the first panzer. First panzer's for the Germans. So this is an SS unit. Um, first panzers are here, oh, off screen. Uh, the first panzers are up near the top there. And we can activate within within five. So we can activate these guys here. Uh, HQs stack for free. So we can move them. Okay, before we, when we come to a more dense situation like this. The, the strict turn order is to determine who's going to take tactical movement, who's taking strategic movement, and who is taking any exploitation moves, which happen after combat. Now, I'm just trying to see, one, two, three, four, five, six, whether it would be worth me activating somebody else uh, within the five movement and then using these as an exploitation. Um, move because we do have the forest which limits the 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 stacking no i don't think it's worth it so let's go one two three four five six okay so that's it the the limitations on the forest has reduced the amount we can move that second unit because we can't enter any forested areas except through the the roads and there's a limit of one unit one counter essentially. Okay, I think we're done with that. I probably won't use that SS division to attack the infantry. It's attacking across a river, which isn't necessarily the best thing. So, and I'll just move this guy as well by. Oh, touch. The the supply. Um, is very important in this game and it's extremely easy for the Germans to keep to lose control of their supply lines and if that happens they've then got dreadful problems um, as the German player next up we have the first army uh, HQ for the allies so army army HQs with the four crosses are slightly different to the uh, core HQ with the three crosses. And what, what they do, the way they activate is somewhat different. You can first activate the army, um, and then following that, you can activate a core HQ of your choice if you wish. Um, I'm just thinking... I won't activate the army, uh, remove the army or, or anything like that, but what I will do is I'll activate that 8th eighth, eighth, uh, eighth core counter and then simply just take the, the counter from the cup and activate it out of sequence. So now we're actually also activating this counter and I'll move that 8th army along just to ensure 
that there's a little bit of extra supply if we need it, or a better supply line. And then we'll move on again. And we have the 47th Panzer Corps for the Germans. 47th Panzers are, where are they? Are they out of supply? Yeah, the 47th Panzers are out of supply at the moment. I won't do anything with those because uh, it's probably not good for the video for me to spend 10 minutes trying to figure out what I'm going to do with those. So let's move on. Second panzers are also out of supply. Um, and I will just move that panzer unit into into the city so that we have better supply lines coming off the off the roads which i probably can't see is that better yeah that's better now we have the seventh seventh uh, core okay so these guys are all the way over here now what i'll do for demonstration purposes as I will place a roadblock and within five movement points of the HQ I can sorry no it's removing I can remove a roadblock within five movement points I can place a roadblock within one hex of my position um, and roadblocks will simply all you do is you place the counter and it acts as a delay for uh, the German forces and before I do that I will just move these other units along and we'll go one two three four just put them here so now we have a uh, more of a challenging position for the Germans to try and take ground. So the 85th uh, German Corps HQ. These guys are down the bottom and let's have a go at showing some combat. So um, first thing you do is you can determine which units are going to be strategically moved, which units are going to be moved uh, tactically and then which are going to be used for exploitation. I think what I'll do is I'll do a combination. So let's strategically move this airborne unit um, and strategic movement gives you a faster movement rate and it's essentially for foot soldiers it is a double essentially you move two squares for every point and so what that will do is that will get us one two three four to here now if any if i am attacked or if that unit is attacked there is a reduction in in some of its modifiers because it's moved strategically so it's slightly weaker uh, but it's a good way of supporting uh, areas you want to prop up um, and, and to move forces quickly um, the we don't have uh, thinking about the exploitation move uh, option we don't have another so um, we will have to just move everybody tactically so we'll move him down here now we're in a forest and that means that only one one division uh, can go there now this is where the differences between divisions and 
non-divisions, so essentially anything with less than two x's. Uh, the rules are slightly different, so we have a forest hex stacked on a road, so really only one division can go in there. So for example, I cannot move a second infantry division in into the, into, into the forest because they're, they're both the same size. However, this artillery counter here is, is not a division, it's a brigade. If we can see that, that's a bit blurry. Uh, there we go, it's a brigade. The single X is a brigade. Um, and so that can actually move and go into that same hex. So it's one of those little things about this game which you need to keep an eye on. Uh, but we can move that division or the, that we couldn't move to... We couldn't move to the um, forested hex. We can move it down this way, here. Now, if you remember the... Uh, the the distance that a core can command is five tactical movement points away. Uh, so we could two, three, four. I oh, know we can't. We can't, can't. We can reach him or this unit here. Can't reach this unit because we cannot draw the command through through the the ally counter. So this this combat here is is basically going to happen on its own. Um, so, how does combat work? Combat is interesting, and let's just place one of these cubes here to show where the combat's happening. It's just going to happen there. It's going to happen down here as well. So, combat. The matrix at the bottom, which unfortunately in these print and play components does <laughs> have a line through the middle, but I do, I do have a, a reference sheet to, to show as well. Um, and what we do as the attacking player, we will choose one of four counters. So we have we have these four, these four counters. We are only attacking with infantry and artillery, so the blitz counter cannot be used. But we'll choose uh, one of the other three, and we will choose. Let's choose a balance attack. The 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 numbers on the top. The top of the boxes are the, the signify that you have to take a casualty check, and any number in there will show the casualty check modifier. The the second set of boxes, the, the below boxes, they are how far, if at all, uh, the units advance and retreat after combat. And I think what we'll do is um, do a balanced attack. That seems to be as it says, a nice balance between the possibility of being able to being forced to to retreat and advance and casualty modifiers and so on. Um, and so we now have the defence. Ordinarily, what would happen in a two-player game is that somebody would choose between all of these uh, six counters that we've got here, six counters, um, and. Uh, without knowing what the other player has 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 selected, they will will decide which of the the six options gives them the best chance of of of, of surviving the attack or of retreating without too many casualties and so on. Um, however, in the solo game, you roll a die, and then there is a table that allows you to sort of random, randomise this really. We have a, a table that 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 randomises which of them is drawn. So the first thing you'll do is roll to see the posture, which in our case we have rolled a four and that's stalwart. Um, and then we'll roll again. Oops, trash everything. And we've rolled a nine. And so under the stalwart option, that means our Allied player is going to delay. So we have the delay counter. And all you do is you move the modifiers. So in this circumstance, there are no casualty checks for either side because there is a dash. Uh, dash just there. No casualty checks. 
However, both sides will move one space and retreat is very simple. Uh, you simply retreat away from the unit that you are being attacked by and you, you simply move uh, away from it. There's no zone of controls or anything like that. And then the other units have the option to move in because you advance one based on the, on the result there. And that's the end of that combat, which didn't really cover everything, but such is the like, draw of the dice, really. Um, so let's move to the other combat, which was here. Um, here we have the same, same thing. We are German players attacking and the Allied player is defending. I'll choose that same balanced attack counter and roll the two D10s. Uh, we rolled a six, which is stalwart again, and we rolled a one, which is stand fast. So looking at our matrix, stand fast is at the top. So we do have to do a casualty check for both sides. And we do then also have to retreat one space as the German player, regardless of what happens with the casualties. And um, the, the allied player, the defending player in blue, does not need to retreat if they survive the casualty checks. The casualty checks are a minimum of one, but the total number of times you will check is dependent on divisions. So if we had two divisions in there, the uh, the defending player would have to, or, well, not necessarily the defending player, but if there were two attacking divisions, um, the defending player would have to make two casualty checks. Similarly, if, if there was two divisions here, the, the attacking player would also take those two casualty checks. We don't have a division, we've only got a brigade, but we still take at least one casualty check if indicated on the matrix. So how does that work? The, the You add the combat factors, so the three and the two. Okay, so you do start with the attacking player and you will take the combat number of the defender, so two, you'll add on uh, the modifier, if any, on the matrix, which in our case is zero, so we're still at two. Then look to the modification list and we ignore the first two because we're the attacker. Now here we have, if, if, our, if the checking unit is poor or has moved strategically, we add on a point, so we're now at, we're now at three. We deduct if there is an elite, which we're not, and then we add on the terrain. And we are in on a road in a lightly wooded area, which in terrain terms for the combat is we add on two. So we are now at five. Yeah, two plus the one for being poor, plus another two, that's five. And that is simply a case of rolling the die. We've rolled less than five. And therefore we take a step loss. Okay, so that has now reduced the strength of that unit. The casualty check is taken, both players take the casualty check simultaneously, so normally this would happen at the same time. Because um, of that, even though we've reduced the strength of the German unit, you'll still take a casualty check using the full combat strength of the German player. And so for the defender, we would now take the attacker's full combat strength, which is three. We'll add on any modifiers, which is one, so that's four. The, we're not being outflanked. We're not fighting with a combat check of, of three, but we are out of supply. Sorry, no, that's only for the attacker. Okay, the, the German attacker is not out of supply, so we're still on a three roll at the moment. The checking unit is poor quality, so that's a four. And then we take that terrain modifier again, except rather than adding it, we deduct it. So it's a two, and we need to roll one or a two, uh, and rolled, rolled an eight. So there's no casualty check, uh, no casualty taken for that force. And the last thing to happen with the combat is we just simply retreat, as indicated on the table. That combat's over. 
Uh, I hope it made sense. Um, okay, let's move on to the next next counter. I'll just mark up that they've been. We have the 58th. Okay, 58th Panzers, which are just here. Okay. Now, our 58th Panzers uh, can control or, or activate the units within five. So one, two, three, four, five. We can activate those two. One, two, three, four, five. I mean, I have to wait that one. I have to go round because there is a river running there, and that um, has implications on the movement points, and it's movement points away that determines control. We also need to make sure it's within 10 of an army HQ. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so let's, let's look at how things like exploitation will work if we can do that um, which I think we can it's only the motorized unit so that can exploit so we'll add exploitation here and what that means is that after move, tactical movement and strategic movement after combat that unit can then move and combat and what we'll do is we will attack we won't really move but we will attack this unit here with these two guys here and it's the same process as before um, so this time we can use the armor the blitz counter because the the unit is an armored counter this is perhaps slightly more representative of combat as you might normally find it okay so blitz let's use blitz the the blitzkrieg attack uh, the attacking player uh, has chosen um, and now we just need to choose for the defender um, to go to five as the the posture which is stalwart again and then a four for the mission which is a balanced defense so our modifying table, our matrix, tells us that we are both, both sides are taking casualty checks. Both sides are going to move after the combat. The attackers are going to advance two, and the defenders are going to retreat three after any, assuming everyone survives any casualties and so on. Okay, let's look at the combat then, and I'll just mark up where we are so that I can place them back, but I'll take the counters off, make it easier to see. So what we have is we have one Allied Infantry Division defending. We have a German Reduced Strength Infantry Division and a German uh, Reduced Strength Panzer Division. Okay. Um, First thing we do then, we we will use the we'll check the attackers' casualties first. So it's one full strength division, um, and that's going to be a combat strength of three plus uh, not outflanked. We're not not outflanked. Uh, checking unit is going to be the tank, and it has to be the tank because you use the blitz mission. Um, so that's elite, so we don't have that. We don't have any air support or artillery. Uh, we do minus one, so we're in three, so that's minus one is two. And then we add the terrain modifier, we're in the rough. That's a modifier of one. Uh, okay, so that is going to be a total of three. Roll the die. If we roll less than three, we take a loss. And that means our, 
core Panzer unit is going to be eliminated. But we'll eliminate them after we uh, have checked the defenders modifying rolls, and that's going to be a total combat strength of four, two on each side. Um, plus the one for a poor quality allied unit, which is the P. Um, minor, pl minus the minus the two. Four. So it's four. So that, that unit is fine. Okay. You need to roll underneath underneath the combat score. The bit that, that tends to trip me up is the the terrain modifiers. You add to the score for the attacker and you take away the score, the terrain modifying score for the defender. But in this particular case, the uh, and you have to roll under that score to, to call the casualty. In this particular case, the attackers are okay. So what happens now is our, our unit, our elite unit, our elite panzer unit is dead. It's removed. The defending artillery, defending uh, infantry unit, is replaced back on. The, is is uh, retreated from its square three spaces. So that's what it says on the mission matrix. So one. And you just have to move away. You, can, you don't have to worry about moving through zones of control or anything like that. So if we just go one, two, three, it's away. Um, and then the attacker has to move, we have to move forward two. So we'll move one and two. That town remains in control of the German side, even though we have left. And that combat's over, the activation's nearly over, we just need to activate the exploitation units, which in this case was only a one armoured division. Uh, the reason we didn't take two checks on that attacker before is because oh, both our divisions re re reduced strength. Um, and we'll move here. We've got quite a strong unit there with artillery and everything. That's that's a, a strong armoured division there. I don't really want to fight them at the moment. Um, so that's just for the purposes of showing how the combat works. Let's, let's attack them anyway, just for the demonstration. So we take that off again. Now we've got one, one elite elite tank unit fighting another elite tank unit with the benefit of artillery. Okay, and that's works slightly different. We won't blitz this time. Blitz tends to result in casualties. Um, what we will do is we will do an infiltrate. We don't really want too many casualties, but we would like to knock the other guys back. That's the wrong counter. So, our German tanks are infiltrating. We're using the infiltrate mission. Roll the die. Two, which is aggressive, and a four, which is defense in depth. And so our mission modifying position this time is here. So we have no casualty check for the attackers. That's good, because they're quite strong. Uh, they defend the allied units, and they would probably make it difficult for us to come away unscathed as German as a German player. Um, and then we do one casualty check for the allies, for the defending allies, and then both sides move. So that's good. That's a good result for us uh, as the German player at the moment. Um, okay, so just the one check on the defender. And we take the total, as before, take the total strength of the combat factor, which is four. We add on, uh, various things. So let's go and run through it. The, they don't, they're not, we're not out of supply. There's no variation in 
combat factors. Uh, it's not overwhelmingly in favour of one side or the other. Uh, we're not a poor unit. We've not moved strategically. The enemy... Uh, okay, here we go. So we are... We have the in-supply artillery. Okay, this is um, not applicable because the attacker does not have to make the check. But if it had been the other way around, if, if this side was attack was forcing a casualty check on the Germans, the artillery would add a plus one uh, into the combat, as would any air, air support, which we don't have because of the weather being overcast. So we have a four, no other modifiers up to now, but we do have an elite tank, which we'll take the check on. The tank would reduce it by one, so that's now three. The terrain modifier, we are in lightly wooded terrain, modifies it by two. So basically a one or a zero will cause a casualty check. It's a seven, so no casualties. Let me simply retreat two. And so we've moved from here to here. And the Germans advance one. And that is the end of that activation. I'm just trying to think if there's anything that I haven't shown in terms of the major mechanics. I've got a few counters to go. Um, the sixth Panzers. Um, are up at the top just here they are an army unit so we can move anybody who is not currently able to be controlled by a core unit and move ourselves we won't do any of that but let's uh, activate another core actually looking at the looking at the board there is no other core able to activate these these units here that's a really not the best position for our pans to be in but we are in command of quite a good position um I do want to try and take that town yeah let's move into the town uh the the army unit can activate anybody who is not currently under command range of a core HQ and then we want to move our panzers in to support One, two. okay uh, two, three, four, five, six. okay there we are that's um, Now, let's leave that there and see if we can activate another core and maybe show you some of the other rules that we can do. Okay, let's uh, move down here. Who have we not activated? We haven't activated the fifth panzer, so let's, so let's activate them. Nope, I can't. Uh, uh, 80th Panzers would be better. Let's activate the 80th. Uh, the reason I couldn't activate the 5th is because they're actually an army unit themselves. I should probably look better at the counters. But here the 80th is a core. Okay, so the core are here. And let's do a couple of things just to show how it will work. Um, Ah, that's this artillery. That's attack with our artillery. Okay, they're moving there. These guys are simply going to not move. Um, and the reason for that is I just want to show how improved position markers work. So if a, if a unit does not move or combat, it can essentially dig in. And you place one of these markers in its terrain 
and it allows you to take a step loss instead of retreating if the mission matrix tells you to. Probably not something you'd necessarily want to do at this point in the game, but just because we haven't shown it up to now, it's there. Combat down the bottom. Again, as before, we'll choose Let's choose a frontal attack just to show the one the mission that we haven't shown yet. So a frontal attack. The defense we will try and find the die. There's the die. Order seven, which is retrograde, which means they're going to run away. And order three, which is delay. So on the matrix, frontal, frontal attack combined with a delay leads to two casualty checks, plus one modifier for the, uh, the attacker, and then everyone runs away or moves, depending on which side you're on. And so doing it starting with the attacker or the casualty check for the attacker, we have one in one division, not even a division, so we just have one. We take the two, we add on Nothing at the moment. We don't reduce anything. I'm going down the list here. Don't reduce anything. Not elite quality. So terrain. We're on wooded terrain. So we add two. So it's four. So less, less than four. We've taken a casualty. Well, the nine. No casualties. That's a better start for the Germans. Um, the defending player. We should have added a 1 to that casualty roll, um, but we're still over it, so that's okay. So the German player then, we have 2 uh, plus the 1 for artillery, plus 1 for being poor, so that's 4, minus 2 because he's defending, so that's 2, so 0, 1, or 2, and we have taken casualty as the allies, we've got 1, we have a casualty, and they're eliminated and our victorious German infantry and artillery units they move forward by one space okay next activation Right, we've activated the British. Um, so the British are all the way up the top. Not very many of them at the moment, but as I mentioned at the start, they are restricted in where they can go and what they can do. They're always considered to be in supply so long as they're this side of the river. Um, and really what you do with these, uh, if we sort of think about the strategy of these guys at the moment, we basically just stop people being able to cross the river, stop the Germans from crossing the river. So. One, two, three. That's all I'll do with those. Keep them that side of the river, preventing any victory point opportunity for the Germans. Um, uh, with that in mind, though, one thing about this game, or I guess any Battle of the Bulge game, or, or, or game that's very heavily weighted uh, at the beginning versus the end of the game towards one side and then the other, um, Opportunities to get victory points now are going to be few and far between because over the next few next few turns at least all the German German forces are basically dwarfed by the number of Allied reinforcements and some of those Allied reinforcements are pretty amazing. They have combat factors of five and and good movement and you know things like that. Whereas the Germans progressively get less high high quality less good quality re reinforcements plus their good stuff that they start the game with are steadily being lost or or uh, reducing strength due to the constant attrition um of combat so next counter then we've got the third army for the uh allies and these guys are these are just here um they're stacked with a tank. Don't 
let's attack the, the try and take by storing back, shall we, from the Germans. So the tank is within supply because this army HQ is within within an unbroken distance from the north, east and south edges of the map. Um, that is in turn supplying this course so, to so, However, that core was activated before, wasn't it? So I should have put a mark on that. However, so that means then that this cannot be activated by any other division and um, or any other core. So the army can the army counter can supply and activate that unit. And we'll send the unit to fight the German the Germans around Bestoin. The Germans are out of supply. There is an artillery unit as well, and they're in a town, which um, is going to make combat quite. Quite interesting. Okay, um, so same thing. I will choose at random this time. This is how I do it. It's not a part of the game, but I choose at random the attack for when I'm when I'm playing one side or the other. Um, okay, let's choose infiltrate. Our armored division are going to quietly sneak around the town of Bastogne. Not sure how that works, but anyway. Um, and as a defender, I will choose counterattack. That's one we haven't shown, and it has a slightly different effect to some of the others. So infiltrate and counterattack. Of course, we should have done that at the same time without knowing what the other person had drawn, but just for demonstration. Counterattack is an interesting one because rather than um, deducting terrain, from your counters, you actually don't really have any modifier for the terrain for um, the defender. So you, you, you're, you're removing that chance of um, protecting yourself through the terrain by, by adding a more aggressive defense defending position. It's quite an interesting way to do it. Um, we both do both have to take casualty checks and there will be a retreat and an advance, assuming we survive. So let's move on to this combat. This combat is going to be slightly different because we have the, the outer supply. We are counter-attacking and we are also uh, using the artillery and so on. Um, so it'll be slightly different to before. Um, starting with the attackers, casualty check, we take the total number in the defending space, which is going to be three. We do not add on one for the artillery because they're out of supply. So we stay at three. The terrain modifier, which would normally be three, two for the fact that you're in the woods and plus one for the town, um, is added on to the attacker's check. So that's a six. So let's roll, we've rolled a seven. No casualty for the attacker. The defender is slightly different. So because we're out of supply and we're counter-attacking, the, the, the total number is still used. So that's, still, that's, that's four, okay? So it's four as the baseline. We minus one because we're out of, um, no, sorry, we, do not add or subtract anything for the fact there's artillery. Um, and then we do not add or subtract anything for the fact that they're in enemy terrain because we're counter-attacking. Um, okay, so we are at a total of three. Three. I'm rolled three, so we take a wound, uh, take a casualty. So that is actually eliminated that airborne unit, which is quite good <laughs> for the purposes of the demonstration because it tells you what happens now with the non-combat units. So combat units have a number for combat factor. Non-combat units, if I just show you the difference, non-combat units have a bracket around them. So the four indicates it's a combat unit, the one with a bracket 
is not a combat unit. When a combat unit is attacked, you don't make any casualty checks or anything like that, they're simply eliminated. If a combat unit is in a space that's been attacked and other combat units are removed, they're eliminated, the non-combat unit, whether that's artillery or HQ, they are also removed from the game. So they're automatically eliminated, which means our tanks move in to Bastogne and reclaim control from the Germans. Okay, a couple more counters to go. The 18th uh, Corps up in the north. Uh, I'll just place roadblocks, I think, for them, for the purposes of the demonstration. Um, so I will activate the counter and place a block across the river, stop anybody sneaking across the Moose River. And then Seventh Army activates, um, which will allow me to move anyone currently. Which I will, I'll not do for now. Um, I think we've reached the end of our demonstration. Just one last counter and um, it's an army counter again, so same same principle. You may, you, 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 anyone who has not currently been activated previously or cannot be activated by a core is now activated. And for the purposes of this, I'll simply activate these ones here. They will move three, taking control of that city. And I'll move my units up as well. And that then is the end of the activation phase or the operation phase we move into the turn end phase and all you do really is you move uh, remove any improvement markers that don't have a unit in the hex you remove any strategic markers any out of supply markers and then you replace any previously omitted uh, eliminated units and the way the way the hqs are eliminated is that they can be placed in a road hex with a line of supply. Uh, so we'll just place like so. And that then is the end of the third turn. Move into the into turn number four. Um, I hope that's that's giving you an overview of the game. Uh, probably haven't covered everything like I mentioned in the beginning, um, but I hope it's enough to know whether or not you'd, you'd enjoy playing this yourselves. So that was Winter Thunder. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I hope I covered most of it, gave you an idea of, of how, how the game works and whether or not it's something you would enjoy. Um, please do like, subscribe, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I do have an interview with the designer, Brian Train, over on the website at www.com. Uh, thanks for joining and I'll see you again next time.